So after we produced James 1, 2 and 3 back in 2014, we um, were very aware, Ronan and myself, that there were three other James Kings to be dealt with. So I encouraged Rona to start thinking about four, five and six. And before I left National Theatre of Scotland, um, I commissioned Rona to write for and write treatments for James 5 and James 6, which is a short pressy of the idea and the story. Um, I left shortly afterwards and um, Rona and I carried on talking about the ideas. And it's taken us seven years to get to this point and to get James the Fourth on. And I think that's for various different reasons, but it wasn't until we put a partnership together with Raw Material, who are an independent producing company, Capital Theatres, um, who uh, wrote, own and run amongst other theatres, the Edinburgh Festival Theatre, where we first produced James 1, 2 and 3, and the National Theatre of Scotland, as well as associate partners. So once we put that together, um, we could start developing the idea, developing the script. Well, so the first part of it is Rona really sharing her idea, what, what she wants to write the play about. And I suppose at that point, I'm a sounding board more than anything else, in that um, we also walked, uh, we, we walk a lot to talk about uh, the plays. Um, I made, trips to go and visit her in Selkirk in the borders and go on some long walks while we just chatted about everything, nothing, and then often talked about the play. Um, and we went to Flodden, which is, of course, where James the Fourth drove the Scottish army down a ditch to its calamitous death at the hands of the English and ends the play and tried to imagine what that might have been like and talked about how the play, which is a, really centred around two um, black women from uh, southern Spain who are brought into the court um, and their relationship and their position within the court, how that connected with James's character, um, the nature of Scotland at that time, and with the um, propensity for all these Scottish men to follow James down to their certain death. So um, that became the beginnings of uh, the play. The process uh, for James IV was slightly different to one, two and three, only because we had a bit more time and we had five weeks in the rehearsal room. It feels a bit of a luxury. Um, it, you know, it's still a big old play and it's 11 actors and there's fights and there's, there's songs and there's dances, so there's a lot to rehearse. It meant that we did spend the first week and a half talking through the script, around the table, discussing it, and Rona produced a new draft at the end of that process. Um, through that process, what you're doing really is you're trying to make sure the story is clear, that it's resonant, that the psychological arcs of the characters make sense to us all, and you're sharing ideas so that you're your perception of the story and the play and the characters changes as you talk to the other members of the company. Some actors really respond to that process and it's a really important part of their process. Some actors want to, ex want to explore it all on its feet and find the process of talking about it too much quite uh, limiting. So you do have to balance the needs of a very diverse group of people. We're trying to do some practical work at the same time. We're doing quite intensive warm-ups with Neil Bettles, the movement director, to get people ready for the fights. We started learning the fights immediately because um, they're long as fights, as, as fights go on stage. There's a six minute fight, which doesn't sound a lot, but actually six minutes of uh, stage combat is takes a lot of time to rehearse and two minutes a tournament in the second half. So that begins immediately, the training of those actors in certain um, skills for the fighting and the making and choreographing of the fighting. Um, so you're kind of keeping several balls in the air until you're at a point where you're up and you're staging. For me, the staging process is a one of exploration in that I don't see it as my job to tell everyone where to stand which um, I think is like a, an old fashioned version or perception of what directors do. What, what I'm really doing is steering the process so that we're making the most interesting 
uh, choices to make the scene come, come to life and feel real and serve the story. So you're on your feet talking about what the character's intentions are, although you've probably decided that already during that process of table work, reading the play, you together have uh, discovered what the intentions of the characters are scene by scene. And then when you're making it, what I'm encouraging actors to do is try different tactics. So you can imagine that you're in the first scene between Queen Margaret and King James in the bedchamber, you're making a decision about what each of them wants. What does James want when he's in that scene? And what does Margaret want? That's their intention. What's their intention moment by moment? And then the fun bit for me is, oh, but what's their tactic? How are they trying to get it? Are they being uh, seductive? Are they being defensive? Are they being aggressive? Are they being sarcastic? It's like the more tools you have to make them behave like real human beings behave in those situations, and we do all of those things all the time without thinking about it, then the more the scene can be alive in the moment. Then you're getting those actors to a point where they're not doing any of that consciously. That's in their body, it's in their, it's hardwired into their brain, if you like, and their voices, so that then they're playing the scene and they're just listening to each other. And if they're doing that, then they can be totally in the moment. And when the audience watch it, it's like that is happening for the very first time. And you sometimes get there and you sometimes don't, to be really frank. If you've dropped any of the balls along the way, then it, it, you might never get there. But my intention when we're in the theatre, um, putting the technical stuff and doing the final tweaks is to then try and get out of the way of the actors so that anything that's a block or a problem or a, something that's stopping them from being in the moment, I'll try and work that out and get rid of it. So you might be asking them to wear a certain costume or to have a certain entrance or exit or uh, to do something in a particular time. And, and if you start to feel as a director that there's something uncomfortable about that for them or there's a beat that's wrong or then you start to make those changes. At many points in the play, characters are actually speaking in something other than Scots. So the two women, Anne and Ellen, who arrive, their first language is Spanish. We have a Gallic prince who's being brought to the court. The royal language that everybody shares, the courtly language is French. You have an English queen who doesn't know Scots, and you have people deliberately speaking broad Scots so that other people can't understand them. So all in all, you've got a court and a world where there's a lot of languages going on. Um, James famously spoke at least five languages, including Gaelic and including Spanish, um, but not everybody did in the court. We got ourselves quite caught up with this early on and that it seemed very important that the audience knew what language everyone was speaking, even though they were hearing it in English or Scots. And um, so every single scene, we decided that in every single scene, we needed to start it in the language that they were actually speaking before they started speaking in Scots. Um, we realised that after a while, the audience really don't care. And it's not important to the plot later on. It's important to the plot at the beginning because it's important for what happens that the two uh, women, Ellen and Anne, um, are not understood by Dame Femi, who's the housekeeper, and that they can speak to Peter, who's the king's right-hand man, who's also from Spain. So um, until they learn Scots, which is like nine months in, which is the middle of the first half. It matters who can understand each other and who can't. After that, we realised it doesn't matter anymore. So we stopped. So they may be speaking French together. They, two people might be speaking Spanish. They might be. But actually, if they're both speaking the same language, it doesn't. Why do we need to even bother the audience with it? So we kept our convention going for the first part of the play. And then we dropped it as 
as the two women began to understand everybody and what they were speaking. There's also, a, we did do something right at the beginning though, where we bring in a slight underscore when the Spanish, the three sp Spanish characters start to speak uh, English, even though we're, they're actually speaking Spanish. So they're speaking English so the audience understand them, um, but other characters don't understand them. So we sneaked in a kind of underscore underneath and then it comes out again when they're um, when they've stopped speaking Spanish and it seemed to help just just give people an indication that there was something slightly different going on there was a new convention the prime challenge was how we treated and rehearsed and presented the poem written by William Dunbar that is spoken in the second half um, it's a really nasty poem full of racial slurs against one of the characters. We did a workshop before, I mean, maybe a year before we went into rehearsal. And probably the most important thing we did was explore with um, a diverse company how that poem made us all feel when the words were spoken, how we could present it, whether we should be presenting it, how we could present it without doing harm to people who are hearing it. That's quite hard when it contains some racial slurs, um, if not impossible. And we had to make sure that we were being very responsible, taking a lot of um, advice and opinion from um, a lot of different people, including Onyeka Nubia, who was our um, historian, and including the actors. We have a wonderful actress playing um, Ellen called Danielle. We improvised what would happen in the speaking of this poem to the other characters. Um, and I, it was actually Blythe who plays Dame Femi, Blythe Duff, who, after we'd tried this and it felt really difficult in the room for us all to sit back and listen to this and even to speak it to the audience, Blythe suggested that what if, um, when this poem is spoken by the Maka, the poet, that if Ellen comes and takes it off him and finishes it herself before responding to it, and that's survived into the play. That's how it works now. And it was some of the words that the actress Danielle spoke on responding to this poem, Rona then took and, and framed them and fashioned them into um, the speech that Danielle makes in the final production. So that was one of the challenges. We had to deal with it very sensitively in the room because actually, however much you you know the context in which you're um, speaking the poem um, and how it will be presented on, on, in the show. It doesn't stop it having some, having some power if you let it in the room. So we had to be very sensitive to um, how it felt to hear it, uh, talk about it. We'd check in with each other and check out again at the end of the day. Also sit in that uncomfortableness of talking about how this kind of racist um, language made us all feel. So, um, yeah, we found our way through with everyone being very honest about um, their opinion on it and how we treated it. Right at the heart of the play is the theme of how power performs itself. How does it display itself? The tournaments are acts of spin in that they're presenting a version of Scotland and a version of the crown. And it's particularly for the French ambassador, the English ambassador, to show that Scotland and the king is powerful and wealthy and cultured. And this was very successful in 16th century Scotland. There was an impression of a much wealthier country and court than was actually the case and a much more powerful court and country than was actually the case. And this served to keep both the French and the English at bay for a long time. So the play investigates that and puts that on stage. And that's, that's one of the big themes by also showing the backstage and the rehearsals. So you 
you have a flip to the first tournament, which is backstage and suddenly the dead bodies are getting up and, and in, in, um, congratulating themselves. They've cut over one of Dunbar's poems. They've, um, by mistake, and he's furious. Um, so you see what's happening behind the, behind the curtain, if you like. And then you're seeing them rehearse the next one. And that's quite disarming. It's quite disarming for critics as well, who expect their history plays to be epic and earnest and dignified. Well, actually, you know, there's nothing dignified about the structures and the levers of power. So that's one of the, the things. Because of course, what happens in the play is that those levers of power in the end are sometimes employed to do real damage to people who are less powerful. And that's what we watch in the play. Um, so you see this poem, bring down a young woman, or try to bring down a young woman, it doesn't succeed, um, through words. And um, that's another one of the big themes is um, about a forgotten moment of history. Um, there's lots of contradictory accounts of um, the Moorish lasses as they're known in historical record. And um, it's clear that there were um, people of African heritage in the Scottish court from very early in positions of great power and status and wealth. And one of them became queen of the fight and presided over the tournaments. All of this is historical record. The lazy assumptions that some commentators and historians have made in the past have been, well, these people must have been slaves or they must have, even though this is way before um, organised you know, mass slavery from Africa, or that they can't have had influence. Whereas actually it's pretty clear, and Onyeka Nubia, our, our historian who we work with us on it, his assumptions around these women are that they were incredibly cultured, they were, they'd probably been to all the major European courts, at least some of them. Um, they were bringing probably a sophistication to the Scottish court that was lacking in, in the Scottish court. So that's another big theme is the, um, the kind of emergence of a piece of social history and, and political history that gets lost when the uh, the powerful are writing the history. And, and also it's a part of Scotland's history that um, doesn't really get taught very much. So, um, and certainly the, the history of early um, black Scots, I don't think has been taught at all. So that's another really important theme in the play. <laughs>